Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. We're going to wait another minute or so as people get settled, but I'm uh, welcome. I'm Simon Rosenberg, and welcome to uh, a new uh, weekly series about American politics that we're debuting today here. It will be uh, every Tuesday or most Tuesdays uh, at one o'clock Eastern time. And if you can't make it, the recordings will be placed uh, on the internet, usually within 24 hours, assuming that we do a good job. And, um, you know, we, uh, this is a new thing for us, but I think that there's just so much going on uh, in American politics right now uh, that we wanted to try to create a regular series of discussions with really smart and innovative people across a wide spectrum of areas of engagement, everything from tactical things about how to win campaigns to the kind of big picture stuff we're gonna be talking about today. And so just, uh, you know, stay tuned with us, come back every week if you can, and um, and also if you have ideas, you know, let us know of people you'd like to see. I'm kicking off the series today with you know somebody who has been an important teacher for me, frankly. Um, you know, I Twitter is um, I've made many new friends uh, with Twitter over the last few years. People who've been in the trenches fighting it out, um, you know, both rhetorically and trying to find new language and new ideas to describe this sort of unprecedented time that we've been living through. And there have been a handful of people that I've have been touchstones for me to keep me uh, sane and to help me understand, you know, what I was seeing. And, and one of them is with us today. Um, and Ruth Ben Guyatt is uh, here as a professor at NYU, uh, noted television commentator. You can't turn on the TV, frankly, these days without seeing her on one of the networks. I went back and reviewed her CV. She's published hundreds and hundreds of articles and Books and books and books. I mean, a noted authority, uh, um, uh, noted historian of authoritarianism, um, and whose work has really become important for this moment. Uh, she has a new book out called Strong Men, where she begins to put the Trump presidency and the experience of Trump into historical context. Uh, it's been widely acclaimed uh, and noted by you know everybody uh, in the chattering classes uh, in in uh, you know in the United States, and so. I asked her to join us today to share some thoughts as we get ready for an impeachment trial uh, next week. And as we sort of try to wrestle and come to terms with the enormity of what happened on January 6th and also just the entire Trump era, I thought there was really nobody who I would rather sit and talk to for the next half hour than, than Ruth. And so Ruth, thank you so much for being here. And just, if you could just Start by just sharing, you know, your general take on where we are, how it fits into historical context. Oh, I should note that we're going to have time for Q and A in about 15, 20 minutes. So just hang tight, everybody, and and we'll we'll get to your your questions. Um, but but um, you know, share with us your, your thoughts about where we are. We're obviously the Trump era is not over, and uh, as much as we want it to be, uh, it's still with us. How should we think about what's happened and what's going to come next? I mean. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to communicate to people for a long time is that if we use the metric of democracy to try and evaluate uh, who Trump is and what he's done, it doesn't work. Democracy with a small d. Uh, and uh, He's never wanted to be a, a democratic leader and his notion of governance had nothing to do with uh, you know, presidential precedent. He was governing as an authoritarian, and that is the frame I believe makes sense. Um, so, when I started uh, writing this book, it was uh, as, and he's in the book, he's in every chapter, and it was as a concerned, you know, American uh, who saw this as a specialist of fascism who saw many things repeating. Um, I started writing about him in 2015. So I wanted to lay out this playbook uh, of tools of rule that has, was pioneered by Mussolini and some early communists and all the way up to Trump uh, with different outcomes in different you know, eras. We don't have a one party state here, it works differently today, but corruption and violence and the myth of national greatness where you, know, you, you have a utopia of something better but it's about making the nation great again always, um, and, and machismo. And so I wanted to also look at what happens when you have a dangerous uh, extremist as a leader and that leaders matter. They set the tone for political culture. 
They set the tone for models of manhood and that's where the machismo is very important. So it's not just, you know, we can laugh at Putin taking his you know, shirt off all the time and Mussolini did the same, but you know, it's about a leader who glorifies lawlessness and getting away with it becomes not only a measure of manhood, but success in politics. And so I really believe that if we try and understand what on earth, you know, happened to the, the GOP, and I was really struck that when Obama had his launch of his book, and I think it was in his conversation with Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic, he said that he was amazed how much the GOP caved to Trump. <laughs> and I thought, well, if he's amazed, and the, this is because if you come at this era of ours through a democratic framework, it doesn't really make sense. So the, the concept I work with in the book is personalist rule. It's when one individual gets a lot of power. Now, Trump's was checked in the end, and he was voted out, which is very unusual. But their own political and financial interests come to, uh, you know, they come to determine national policy, domestic policy, foreign policy gets privatized. Uh, the party's time and resources get hijacked around his personal judicial struggles, his personal whims. And they set up these structures of governance, which we're very familiar with, where uh, they surround themselves with flatterers and family. And these are things that you know, Erdogan does, Orban does, where sons-in-law have importance. And so all of this I saw playing out in America. And the real interesting, it's, it's in a way it's a real American story is that, so all of this logic was playing out. You saw the conversions of people like Mike Pompeo who became like you know, a, a dictator junior with the swagger and the corruption and William Barr. And I really think these people were energized by the idea of having no limits, of working for someone who um, glamorized lawlessness. And that's really important in, in understanding what's happened to the GOP and how also extremism has been legitimized. Uh, and it's something that, again, is less in the frame of democratic precedent, but it's how authoritarianism works. So that's why I wrote the book and the chapters are structured. Uh, each one goes over a hundred years. So you can see like for propaganda, what has changed like and what stayed the same. One of the things stayed the same is leader cults. <laughs> and so of course, coming to our present, you know, everyone wonders how the GOP has, you know, just stuck with Trump through the, you know, for through thick and thin and how they've let themselves been intimidated by him to the extent of you know, being afraid to vote for his impeachment. Uh, the Senate acquitted him, you know, a lot of them out of fear. And again, these are authoritarian leader follower dynamics. These are not dynamics that you see in democracies. So that's, that's just the introduction to the way that I see things. And unfortunately, I, I'm just sorry to have been right <laughs> because <laughs> I, I wrote a piece before Trump was inaugurated for CNN and I great credit to them for publishing all my things that people thought they were crazy. Um, and it was called Trump is following the authoritarian playbook. And it was like five days before he was inaugurated and many subsequent pieces and they've all, they've all been accurate. Um, and I wish that weren't so. How do you, I, one of the questions I've always had is given that he had never run for office before or been in public office, how did he get so good at it so quickly? I mean, I wrote a piece about a year ago going down my own checklist of all the things that he had done that were in the authoritarian playbook to your, to your frame. And it was amazing to me how many of these things that he had done. I mean, it was as if he had mm -hmm. a list it was given to him by Putin or Erdogan and said, here's how you are a little young want to be dictator, here are the things you need to do. And I just wondered whether or not you think he's been coached a little bit by Putin and Erdogan and some of the others that he's traveled with in these circles over the last few years, because he got awfully good at this awfully fast in a culture that had no real tradition for any of this, right? Yeah, um, I mean, some of it is personality type and I don't go into psychological uh, psychoanalytical things in my book. I don't ever call him a narcissist, but I was really disturbed <laughs> to see that he has this, Trump has the same personality uh, profile 
as all the other leaders I studied, the impulsiveness, the need to humiliate people, the recklessness. So another thing is that a lot of these men who have success come into office from the outside and they've got experience in mass communications and manipulating people, you know, like a marketer. So Mussolini was a journalist, Mobutu in the Congo was a journalist. Um, you know, Hitler took hypnotism lessons, he practiced in front of mirrors. So they work hard at their uh, skills of connecting and communicating with people and they do so in original ways. And so this is very, very important, uh, this direct unmediated communication they have with the public. That in terms of, that's less true of for elites. Why do elites buy in? But this is for the public. How do they know how to do this? And, and this kind of, uh, they, many of them come to office with a criminal record or under investigation. So Mussolini and Hitler and Putin and Berlusconi, who's a very important precedent. Um, and they've inhabited this gray zone between law lawlessness and lawfulness, between legality and illegality. And that was whole, Trump's whole business model. So sadly, he never really changed. The culture adapted around him. And that's what happens when these guys come on the scene. That's astonishing. What are your thoughts about, if you were talking to the House and Senate leadership right now about the coming impeachment trial, uh, the, the fact that, and you mentioned this in the video that you made last week, the fact that the Republicans have been unrepentant, right? They've not, there's been no process to acknowledge fault. I mean, McConnell is sort of on the edges of it right now, trying to draw a line on the very edge of where he could draw a line. It's not really an essential place, but it's what's been striking to me having, I've now worked in politics since the early late 1980s, early 1990s. And I've been in the game with these Republicans in the business. I've been struck by how, how the rapidity of the extremism yeah. and also the, the fact that there is no sense of remorse or, um, you know, want, uh, or repentance now. And I, and I wonder about what your thoughts about what this means going forward and how Democrats should be, you know, girding themselves to the battle ahead. Yeah, I think, um, the, you know, the precedent doesn't promise well, where I was really struck by this op-ed that Cheryl Brown did after the Senate acquittal in February 2020, where he went around to his colleagues, Republican colleagues, he asked them why they voted to acquit Trump, and most of them said they were afraid. <laughs> um, and then the same thing happened we saw in the second impeachment, where the few people, the Republicans who voted for impeachment had to get you know, security for their families because there's this thug culture. And I, have a, I had a hashtag that, I re, that recurs called thugocracy, which is not really a word, but it expresses what happens when people like Trump come to power. So that doesn't you know, bode well. But the other thing is when the history of authoritarianism has this great concept of authoritarian bargains. And it's when these elites bring the extremist into the system, uh, Donald Trump, knowing he's reckless, but thinking they can tame him. And so you had Jeff Sessions do this, you had Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy, who's now, of course, much in the news. And some of them support him because they know, they think he's gonna deliver for them. And this was the evangelicals. And, and Trump has hugely delivered for those groups, for you know, Christian, white Christian hegemony, for evangelicals, for Orthodox Jews. He has actually held up his end of the bargain. So some of them are motivated by, they think they can get him to help them do things they, they wanna do anyway. And it often works out well for them. And that's why they stick with them. Others become entranced or they, again, they become uh, habituated to this, this kind of political culture of lawlessness. And then they don't want to leave. And, and the horizon seems unlimited to them. Now he got voted out. And so it's all the more interesting. And I predicted this, that he hasn't lost his pull so far, they're sticking to him. And, and a lot of people said, oh, he's gonna be finished. And I kind of knew better because the his, also the history of these people with like Berlusconi, he was forced out in 2011, but he retained his personality called, he retained his party power. He was prohibited from running for office for five years, but his party almost won again. <laughs> Despite all the sex scandals, corruption scandals, Eurozone crisis, they lost by less than 1% to the center left two years after he was forced out. 
So the dur durability of these figures and their influence, and this is where they have links to organized crime uh, and other thuggish elements and extremists, and people are afraid. So that's part of it too. So what happens, Ruth? Where, where do we, what, what, we, what do you think, should the Democrats, you know, one of the proposals that's out now is the idea of delay, slowing down the trial and letting it play out. Because if we have a rapid trial that leads to exoneration, what good is that, right? What story are we gonna tell? What, what strategically, how do you think Democrats should approach this opportunity to tell a story about Trump and his time in office um, should they go bigger than just focusing on the events of January 6th and talk about his entire presidency? I mean, what would be your advice about what kind of narrative they have to convey during the trial whenever it happens? Yeah, the storytelling is, is essential. And it does, the, January 6th was the logical outcome of everything that the GOP and Trump have, are, basically. And the cultivation by Trump of extremists from without the system, from inside the system. And of course, the more we know, uh, which was predictable about January 6th, it was an inside job as much as you know, people in animal costumes. Uh, and, and we're going to know more and more about this as time goes on. So we can't restrict the scope just to January 6th. But history shows also, if you don't push back very vigorously against corruption, that has to be part of the story. Because Trump basically, you know, he never wanted to govern. What he wanted to do was convert public office, and he did so successfully, into a mechanism for private enrichment. So the people, I, it makes me irritated when people keep saying he's lazy and they point to the golfing, because the golfing, so that's the democratic frame. He's yeah. lazy, but the authoritarian frame is he's, when he's golfing, he's making money for Trump organization. That's what he's doing. He's promoting Trump properties. So that has to be part of the story. Um, but if you don't push back vigorously in, in Berlusconi history shows this, he was voted out and the, the center left in Italy didn't wanna make that a priority, they wanted to turn the page, they wanted to be positive. And citizens got very angry uh, that they didn't do anything about his corruption. And he came back in less than two years later. He returned, he was voted back into office. So you have to make a stand for accountability, for transparency, for ethics in government, and for decency. Um, that all of that is really crucial. Tall order, tall order. Well, it we're is, gonna. <laughs> but it's worth trying. If you don't try it, um, the the results are are catastrophic because Trump has he was voted out. So we have a very good blueprint what to do to bolster democracy and local politics is important, but he also left a blueprint for the future Trump, Trumpoids, Trumps and pseudo Trumps and of what to do to wreck democracy further. And there are plenty of people waiting in the wings to finish what he started. So let me ask you about that. And that'll be my last question is that, you know, I've written a lot in the last few weeks about the concept of de-radicalization that I don't think that we all collectively understand how radicalized not just the party is, but how radicalized the, the language of Republicans has become. And, and yeah. even today, um, you know, moderate Republicans are still using terms like radical left, which is a invention of Trump, which was, is to me, was the permission structure that he used to create the insurgency. And yet Marco Rubio, a, fight, a guy who fought, you know, his identity is about a fighting authoritarianism, right? It's who he is is using this, this language, which is in essence still a remnant or a relic of a call to violence. And I wonder about your thoughts about, you know, what is the off ramp here? How do we, you know, how do we, it's, how does this, let's paint the positive scenario where the, the Republicans start to repent and move in a positive direction. The Democrats are forceful in their prosecution. What does that look like over the next few years? I just don't think they're going to repent. <laughs> because um, I am an optimist in my personal, as a person, <laughs> but uh, look, Trump got more votes. He was voted out, but he got more votes in 2020 than 2016. And they've seen that for part of their base, you know, this message of, and this racism pay, they pay off. Um, 
I do think that there is a section of the voters for Trump who believed this is why you're, it's very important to raise this uh, rhetoric of radical left. They may not have loved Trump, but they believed the rhetoric about that socialist apocalypse was coming if Biden was elected. And I, I think that there is a chance uh, in maybe in nine months or so, uh, if there's economic relief, if the coronavirus is handled in a competent manner, and they see that socialist apocalypse is not in fact arriving. <laughs> um, and I understand that the way that, you know, Fox would keep replaying, you know, the flame filled cities. My mother who lives in England and has become radicalized. She was a Sky News conservative. She's become radicalized by watching RT, which she doesn't believe is Russian propaganda. And she was calling me months after the protest stopped with because she was watching uh, footage replayed that New York City was in flames. And I would go out and show her that there were no flames, but she didn't quite believe me. So it, we're up against uh, something that's very difficult to tame. I do believe in bridge building. I think it's really good that people like Pete Buttigieg go on Fox News. Uh, we, we probably have to do more of that. Um, there are limits to that, but uh, because the, this is very powerful rhetoric and I was unpleasantly surprised to see, uh, I knew about fascist rhetoric, but the, some of the things that William Barr, his, if you look at his speeches as I did to the police, some of the language is identical to language of Pinochet in Chile, the whole right-wing authoritarian tradition is embodied in those speeches. So there's been years of radicalization of convincing law enforcement and it's also in the military that they're against uh, criminal predators. There's never an end. It's like permanent warfare. The DHS was infected by this and ICE and it didn't start with Trump, but it hugely accelerated. So we Democrats have to have a much more vigorous counter narrative to all this. And one of the things of we've taken our democracy for granted and we haven't had a strong enough uh, push back a strong enough identity because many felt we didn't have to. And if there anything can come out of the Trump years in January 6, it's the need for a much, much more a stronger profile in every way. So the last point I want to make is that um, on July 4th, President Trump gave a speech at the White House. It was an official event. Um, he did these back-to-back -back events on July 3rd on Mount, on Mount Rushmore and then on July 4th, where he essentially rolled out in my mind the campaign to begin um, the call to arms of his supporters. It was the beginning of the, it was the, it was the beginning of the process that, that culminated in January 6th. And what was so striking to me, Ruth, and it gets to what you were talking about, so the evocation of the language mm -hmm. that we've all seen before, that almost when it comes out of an American leader's mouth, it almost feels comical, right? Um, but he said, the most extraordinary, I think it was the most extraordinary speech of his presidency, because he said that, you know, we hunted down, you know, we, we basically eliminated fascism and communism, we hunted down ISIS and Al Qaeda to the ends of the earth. And now we are going to eliminate the radical left. Yeah. And he, he put the American government, not just his party and not just his personal politics, but the government of the United States, it was an official speech, right, from the White yeah. House and saying our government now is going to hunt down the radical left the way that we hunted down Al Qaeda, ISIS. And I read it, I was read it the next morning and I had and friends of mine who know me well, my hair was on fire for weeks because I said, I hope everybody understands what Trump just did, right? Which is that he's declared his domestic opposition to be political enemies worthy of killing and hunting down to the ends of the earth is the term that he used. That's exactly and, it. And, and I, and I don't, I, what was shocking to me, Ruth, and I know you got quoted in a David Nakamura piece right after that, because I sent David your way and encouraged him to talk to you, but I, it was amazing how that speech got virtually no attention in the United States. It's because it's, because part of it is, it's too, I mean, because I was, I was tweeting about this also, it's having studied, you know, right-wing authoritarian counterinsurgencies, uh, the, the military coups, all, because fascism was that too. Um, 
it seems too strange to have the war come home, even though what was going on this summer was to me with all the flooding of DC with all the troops and the psychological warfare, it was a big psyop with the unmarked troops and the, the stagings, the political theater of the, you know, dozens and dozens of troops, some, you know, the unmarked to, and the bundling of people into vans, all of this, uh, was a rehearsal I felt for something that could come later. And this is counterinsurgency and we know how to do it very well. So this is again, if you, if you have this um, firewall between all the things that the US has always done to, to disrupt democracy abroad in the years of military coups and also their counterinsurgency, but you think it can't happen here, none of it can happen here, you're not gonna understand what Trump was trying to do. And I do see it I see it as an attempt at a kind of right-wing counter-revolution. Now that sounds like a very radical thing to say, um, and but I, I, this is what uh, is. It's the logical culmination of, via rhetoric, via attempts. It didn't work, and he got voted out. But the the germ of it is there, and it's very scary. And I also think we haven't even begun to assess the scale of the destruction he wrought. Uh, with government and civil service. This ideological warfare that resulted in thousands and thousands of people being forced out through hostile workplaces or and, and staffing bureaucracy with ideologues because counter revolutions need people, they need bureaucrats, right, as well as soldiers. So there's a lot of really scary things were interrupted when he got voted out. Um, and for that, I am eternally grateful because I believe a second term would have been quite, quite tragic. So let me, my last question, my last, last question is that, um, do you think the term insurgency that is accurate to, to understand what's happening right now inside the United States? And when we look at the groups who organized, I mean, it may have been an insurrection. I mean, what's the right academic term for where we are right now and, and that, you know, post January 6th? I, um, I'm not really using insurgency because um, I'm using coup attempt. It was a self coup. It, it was, and the more we're gonna know about how many people from inside institutions were involved and donors and campaign officials, it qualifies as a self coup where somebody in power is trying to stay in power because that was the point was to disrupt the certification of results and somehow uh, help him to remain in power, somehow overwhelm, interrupt the process of governing. So, um, I mean, the insurgency, it was an insurgency because there are a lot of anti-government people involved, but that kind of clouds the waters. I like to keep the focus on what the end result was supposed to be, which was to keep Trump in office. This, this is the key. Okay, let me, um, Ruth, you've been amazing. Let me open it up for a few questions. And there are two ways to ask questions, folks. One is the Q&A feature, and we have a couple questions already. And then also, for those of you who are Zoom veterans, you know you can raise your hand and, I, and just come right into the conversation. I can call on you. Let me start with, hey, Keith. Keith said, uh, Keith Berwick uh, from the Aspen Institute asked, can we see the other participants? And I, this is a webinar and not a meeting, Keith. So unfortunately, it's just me and Ruth today. And, uh, but maybe we can use a different format going forward. Alex Knopp has asked a good question, which is, can you please discuss the impact of Trump's TV celebrity status on his ability to succeed in the election? My opinion has been that people voted for him as the normalized successful business person who could announce you're fired, but that would not do well in the national vote when people, but anyway, and so you get the sense. I mean, talk about his TV career as, a, as an important predicate for what happened next. Yeah, I think that as we, um, I'm going to do an op-ed about this actually, uh, as we get further out and assess him, this aspect of him, the performer, the, the reality star, the embodiment of a certain uh, American um, vision of success and glamour and luxury is going to be more important. The New Yorker interviewed me right, uh, it was either right before or right after the election in 2016. And I was talking about this uh, and I showed the New Yorker, uh, John Blitzer, I showed him a picture of Trump with 
uh, from the Sharper Image Catalog in 2007, because I have a vast Trump image archive. <laughs> Um, and I sh and it was Trump and his stakes. And I said, you know, Trump's always been like the uh, the ev he's the everyman, and yet he's the glamorous man above it all. And so he's selling wine, he's selling stakes and things that seemed like luxury. And so it's aspirational. So this part is very important of Trump coming in and saying he can make things better. He can fix it. Only he can fix it, indeed. And the other part that's so important is the performer. He was, he's an extremely uh, experienced marketer and propagandist, and he surrounded himself, to pick up something you asked before, um, he surrounded himself by people like Roger Stone who have decades of experience with uh, psychological operations. They, he worked, you know, Manafort and Stone worked for Mobutu, who's in my book. They worked for Ferdinand Marcos and a fraudulent election of his. Uh, Manafort worked for Putin. So these people know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and Trump is extremely, um, he will be whatever you need him to be. And he read the market and he, he's completely amoral, but he allied with the evangelicals and Orthodox Jews. And that's what all these guys do. It was the same with Mussolini. They know how to be what the culture needs them to be at that moment. And as such, they are performers. Ruth, all this stuff, it's, uh, you're, you're doing great, thank you. So next question from David related to this, which is how do we, this is David Krawitz, um, how do we address the alternative worldviews um, simulated by these different news outlets? Can you, can, how can you have a democracy when there's not a common, common understanding of reality? Yeah, it's very difficult. And as you know, many watching will know, we are a little unusual in the world that we have these two huge parties and really nothing else. And how dangerous is that when one of these two giant parties gets hijacked by, and hijacked isn't quite right because the GOP was already drifting toward authoritarianism. It already was. This is another story that we know but will become more important. It already had embraced a kind of authoritarian political culture, not interested in opposing points of view, not interested in mutual tolerance. Uh, bipartisanship was, you know, something not as popular. So it's going to be very difficult to govern. And one of the things I'm worried about is an attempt to, and this is a playbook that's been used in other times and places, an attempt to make uh, Biden's uh, administration seem uh, like incompetent, unable to govern, so that you create even more demand for authoritarian, get things done, law and order. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult to get past that. I think there are a lot of very uh, important bridge building initiatives in civil society. It's a little hard to do them right now because of the pandemic. They involve debates and shared spaces, um, but there are a lot of very valorous initiatives in, at the level of civil society that are trying to break down these barriers and have a common language. And that is the way to go. And I think faith will be important. It could be secular civic faith. It could be religious faith. That's also very important in recuperating a shared sense of, um, I don't know, patriotism, of honor, decency. You know, I was a regular on Fox for 17 years. And, uh, and I went on two to three times a week, every week of the Obama presidency defending Obama. And I quit in late 2017 uh, because it became impossible. I realized that it became impossible for me to go on air because sometimes I didn't know what the host was talking about. Like I literally didn't understand the references or, the, or they would say things about something, a policy initiative that had never actually happened or their interpretation of it was so far off from reality that my ability to connect to the dialogue on air started getting very strained. And I was, get, I was getting worried about, frankly, being embarrassed, like that I would be so ignorant. And the, the anchors, you know, I went on with Bill O'Reilly. I went on with everybody for years. There was always a line that didn't cross about badgering you, the hosts, right? You may get into it with, but when Roger Ailes was head of Fox, they kept within a box, the anchors. When he died, yeah. I think all hell broke loose in Fox. 
And and I felt because I was there on air during that period, and I quit because I had a, a an anchor uh, who would repeatedly attack me on air and 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 go after me in a completely uncontrolled, emotionally out of control way during the daytime, which is the news the news time, and to the point where she even pursued me in one instance on Twitter and started unleashing hounds to come after me on Twitter, and the network called me and apologized. Like I got a, I got a call from one of the highest people at Fox to apologize, but I worry, I, I, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with Fox. And what I'm worried about with Fox is that because of the, the success of OAN and, and the, uh, you know, the more right-wing channels is they're getting dragged further to the right. And I think that people, I think when the history book is written on Fox, I think we're going to look back incredibly at the Roger Ailes years as being Fox was within a certain sort of parameter that when he died and was disgraced, it just, it, it was, it became Trump as opposed to being Republican. And, um, and that was a, that was a terrible, I think, moment. I could feel it on the air. I could feel the change happen over a period well, of months. You know? It's also what happens when the president of the United States pursues a, a personalized politics that he threatens individual people, which he started doing during his campaign, even college students, union leaders, anybody who crossed him became a personal enemy. And, and we can't underestimate, I don't want to make it all about Trump because he's nothing without the GOP. He depended on Sessions and Mitch McConnell and to, to get him in there and keep prop him up. But in terms of this kind of change of tone and making legitimizing a threat, uh, which is a totally authoritarian thing, and you know, people who say, well, why are you blabbering about authoritarianism? You're talking, but you know, you're not in prison, but look at somebody like Viktor Orban, who's used threat extensively, who's, who makes people self-censor, but he hasn't poisoned people. He hasn't used too much violence. So this is why you know, our, we need to have a global point of view and a real understanding of how these things work. I mean, I've been the, the all of us who speak out, I've had uh, trolls, you know, waves of trolls organize things. It's very unpleasant for the time that it endures. It's terrible. And then it passes and they go on to somebody else. But the, the, the point is to shut you up. Um, right. and, and we can't give into that. That's why I keep coming back and saying more because otherwise they win, they win the space and our message is, is overwhelmed by their message. It's gonna be fascinating. I, I agree with you that there needs to be a campaign to go back on Fox and repopulate. It's gonna take a, a particular type of person. I'm thinking of signing back up for that. I was never paid. I did all this for free forever because I didn't wanna be paid by Rupert Murdoch. I didn't wanna take money from him. And I've been thinking a lot about now trying to go back on. And I will tell you Ruth, what was interesting about what you said is that I've been doing this a long time. Right, and I started feeling physically unsafe when I would go on air, and in a way that I had never, even with Hannity and O'Reilly and all these guys, I never the threats. There was a dramatic escalation of the language of attacks on people. I think starting in like the spring of 2017, yes. and I think one of the things we're going to learn is that Bannon, I think, and you know, I studied disinformation in the 20. I ran a countering disinformation operation for the DCCC in the 2018 elections. It was the first ever countering disinformation operation in a major party committee. And so I've studied this language and the evolution of this stuff. And what was incredible to me was that I could see new permission structures being created by people who were trolls who were pushing the language beyond where it used to go. Yeah. So, so people then could follow them. And so whatever the word is, and I won't use it, that word got used by trolls then Regular citizens started using those words, right? And and there was a dramatic change in the in the language that was used to attack me on on Fox, starting in April May of 2017, That's it. The, the fall, yeah. and it was orchestrated. I mean, somebody was behind that. There was a there was an effort to create more violence in the language. I I think, and what you know, and I, my I'm nominating Bannon to be the guy that that did that, and because uh, at that time he had access to an organization. That was involved in this kind of stuff but let yeah. me yeah go ahead no no please we can take another so question. let me take one last question and keith um is it a foregone conclusion that the republicans will prevail in the midterms as somebody who was the chief strategist for the democrats in the 2018 midterms which was obviously an incredibly important victory for us in the house that began 
showing that it was possible to defeat Trump. Um, no, there's no foregone conclusion. And I think that McCarthy right now, I mean, if you're uh, a middle of the road Republican or you're somebody who cares about our democracy and hasn't been radicalized, why would you ever give money or support Kevin McCarthy at this point? And I, and I think that McCarthy, particularly now that McConnell is creating sort of distance between him and the radicals, you know, not too much distance, but enough to claim that he's not one of them any, any, anymore, um, is that I think McCarthy and the House Republicans are an incredibly unattractive enterprise for sort of the marginal money on the side. They, they are very reliant on a small number of donors, corporate donors and individual donors. They don't have strong grassroots fundraising actually in the Republican party, believe it or not, beyond Trump. And so I'm optimistic, frankly, that Democrats, I, I mean, I think we're likely to keep the Senate, you know, barring some kind of catastrophic fall of Biden world. And frankly, Biden's numbers at this point are, are very strong and his negatives are very low. I mean, what's interesting about Biden right now is positives may not be as high as we would want, but the opposition to him is in the mid thirties right now, which is That's as it. Ruth is, you know, it's incredibly low, right? Um, and, and so people are giving him a chance, right? He's being given a chance. People wanna see what he can do. I'm, I'm pretty confident, Keith, that if I had to put my money down, I think we're gonna keep the House and the Senate in the midterms. Um, because I just think that the idea of bringing Kevin McCarthy back means you get Trump back. That may work for some marginal voters that he's exciting, but I think that for broad civil society in the country, we've rejected that politics in the voting booth. It's, it isn't done. It's not over as Ruth's saying, but I think they're gonna have a hard time putting together the kind of operation that they need given how radicalized the house has become and how undeniably radicalized the house has become and that their, their inability to create distance. But man, we'll see what happens with that. I mean, we've got a long way to go uh, between now and the election. So Ruth, final thoughts today? I mean, anything you wanna conclude with? I just think it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, we're at a crossroads because we were in denial for a very long time about what the GOP was becoming. I think it's really important that, you know, comparative politics studies put the GOP as a far right party now. It's not a conservative party. It's, it's rhetoric, it's platforms line up with, you know, far right parties all over the world. And we need to be very sober and look uh, at ourselves in the mirror to see what this is because you can't combat something if you're not going to accept the reality of what it is. Um, I think also it's very important in the next year to have a strategy of uh, bridge building, of recapturing some kind of center um, uh, and, and, and getting back people from uh, you know, this kind of world of disinformation. And if we do that successfully, that will help things in the long run. But the next uh, year or so, the strategy used, the messaging used is really important. And I'll just conclude by saying, Ruth, that first of all, thank you. And thank you for all your work and your courage and your bravery and just your, just the, um, your speaking in plain English. These are complicated things. And I think that we're struggling in American English to really, I, I've been struck by many of the other writers that I talked to, Greg Sargent and others, Greg, who I talk to almost every day, um, we struggle that in American English, some of these things are new to us. I mean, we don't, yeah. it's hard. We don't have great vocabulary. We don't have great historical references, right, to be able to look back on. And so I think creating a, um, a rhetoric and a language and an explanation is so hard. So thank you for all that you're doing to bring it into plain English. And, I, and I'll just make one final comment based on the final thing you said is that I wrote a magazine piece. I was asked by a, a leading Latin American intellectual journal called Letras Libres, um, a good liberal journal based in Mexico City, to write a piece about the Republican Party in the summer of 2012. And my conclusion of the article was that we can no longer describe Republicans as conservative. We have to view them as reactionaries. Mm -hmm. And I used the term reactionary. And Ruth, I had to, it was like two weeks of me debating with myself about whether or not if I use that term, would I be sort of um, going outside the bounds of civil discourse in the United States, right? Because it was, it was, a, a, it was a radical assertion that basically they were a proto-fascistic party, right? And, and this was in 2012, I wrote this. And, mm -hmm. and what I wrote was that 
my worry is this is where they're going and I don't think there's anyone strong enough to stop it. Mm -hmm. and, that, well, and, that we have, and it was it, like, yeah, I mean, but the thing is to your point is that they've been a reactionary party for a long time and, and we are just waking up to the significance of this. And, and I think that, you know, the, the question of, for all of us about why it's been so hard for us to create a language and an explanation for what we're seeing with our own eyes. Maybe we can come back in a few months, Ruth, and keep up that part of the conversation. Because I will tell you, it's something I've worked as an insider in the game. I have been a, an irritant about this um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a bludgeon with important people <laughs> about us needing to call, you know, to call a spade a spade. I mean, to be clear that we're dealing with something that is outside the American political tradition, the Western political tradition, um, and, that, and that we need to be more courageous about calling them out for this. And I think Biden is in this fascinating place right now, right, where he wants to bring people together and work across party lines while also, and the way I describe it is we have to be able to, you know, uh, love the sinner and hate the sin, right? Like we've got to be able to distinguish between good Republicans and then this ideology that has driven them and the country off the cliff. And, and we've got work to do. Our, our elected leaders have work to do to figure out how to do this. But I think January 6th has changed everybody in Washington. And I think even just AOC's Instagram uh, discussion mm -hmm. last night was a new edge in us getting to a place where politicians are getting comfortable talking about the extremism that they're witnessing in their own daily lives, right? And the fear that they have for their own safety. So I, I think we're getting there, but we have a lot of work to do. And listen, buy her book. It's called Strong Men. Uh, I hope all of you buy it today. You can't just go to Amazon right now and pick it up uh, and order it. And, and Ruth, thank you so much and keep up the great work. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.